<clears throat> okay, good afternoon, everyone, once again. Um, I think we, we can go ahead and the others, can you hear me, first of all? Yeah? Um. <clears throat> okay, great. Um, so I think we can go ahead and the others will join us shortly, hopefully. Um, Welcome to this particular workshop and a quick orientation. Um, thank you, Rajkumar. <laughs> Welcome to this workshop, a quick orientation to Zoom. Um, this is the first time we're doing this particular workshop. Um, normally we do orientations to Blackboard, Collaborate, to my e-learning, <clears throat> and a host of other things. Um, but this particular session, we decided to, to well, of course, because of the request, um, we decided to give it a shot. And of course, we know that the whole um, pandemic and all these things that are going on, all right, um, kind of warrant this as well, all right? So let me just make sure I think the session should be recorded. Is anyone seeing a red dot on their screen to see that it's recording? Because I'm showing my screen right now. Yes. Okay, great. Just making sure. All right, so <clears throat> welcome to the session. And those who know me know that I like to start off, oh, just off the bat, this is going to be, um, I know the hour is a bit late um, and we're all tired, but it's and possibly cold because I know it's raining in uh, several parts of the country, including over here. So um, I'm going to make it very, try to make it very quick <laughs> and sweet, hopefully. And um, hopefully we could, we, could, we could wrap it all up and accomplish our objectives within the next two hours or so. All right, so anyone who knows me or knows the workshops that I do, you know that I like to start with an icebreaker, yeah? And it's funny that I have this particular graphic because it's so cold over here. I'm not sure if it's raining by you guys. Um, so anyways, we're gonna start with a bit of a um, let me just post the links in the chat. So what I want you to do, oh, it's raining by you, Rajkumar. Okay, fair enough. So I just posted some links in the chat, and these are some questions that I want you to answer um, for our icebreaker. Is that okay? So you can just go ahead and click on the link, and you can let me know if it, you know, if you get through it. You should be able to get through. And um, and yeah, and, and I should be seeing, okay, good. Some people are, are posting already. So far, everyone for question one, um, your technology use has changed between um, pre-COVID to now. Yeah. I'm not seeing anybody saying no, or I don't know. So I guess that's a good thing. Um, we know that this, this pandemic has really brought on the need for, I wouldn't say just change, but to adapt, you know? People say it's a new normal. I just say it's, a, it's an opportunity to adapt, yeah? So, okay, so, so far, and I might come back to this, all of us have, um, our technology usage has changed between um, pre-COVID and now. Moving on, let's see. Sorry, it's con right. Okay, good. Um, what technology tools have you used in your teaching practice or educational context prior to COVID-19? That's the second question. So you could just click on the link. Let me know if you're not getting through. I'm not getting through. Hold on. You're not getting through? No, I'm the screen has not changed from the first one. Oh no, you have to click on the link again. Click on the on the link in the chat. Sorry. Oh, in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Under question two, you click on that link. Um okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Justin. Um, in the chat. 
In my chat, I'm not seeing the link. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me post it again. No, you may just have to scroll down, you know. Yeah, I'll post it again. So I just, I just place it in the chat. So this is okay. Look, I'm seeing some responses. Okay, good. So so far, um, the technology tools that um, that you guys have been using include Skype. Wow, Skype. <laughs> I like that Skype and my e-learning, um, BBC, Blackboard Collaborates, Zoom. Okay, so we have some people using who have used Zoom. Email, wow, yeah. My e-learning, Blackboard, Zoom, uh. WhatsApp, Facebook. I'm interested to know how do you use WhatsApp because I've been advising it for years, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I wasn't sure how many people were, were implementing it or in, um, including it in, in their teaching practices. Whoever, you can respond, whoever said WhatsApp. Is it that you created a class group? Yeah? Oh, sorry guys, to, to, to say something, if, um, you may not be familiar. It's just to hit the microphone at the bottom of the screen. It should be on the left side. All right, so I'm seeing Blackboard, Collaborate, My Learning, PowerPoint. Okay, good, good, good. Zoom, <laughs> very limited. But you use Microsoft Teams, good, okay. And I was actually in a little informal uh, meeting with, with somebody from SITS and you know we've been looking into that as well. So Microsoft Teams, expect it soon. All right, Laura, so in the chat you said Zoom, Google Classroom, okay, good. PowerPoint and WebEx. Good, so we, we've been using quite a bit of technology tools. And um, based on, on the responses so far, um, we have been using Zoom, but very limited. All right, and hopefully this session can shed some light on, on that as well. I'm hearing some, somebody, no? Okay. All right, so the next question. Were you comfortable using those tools in your educational context? Everyone said yes, so you're comfortable using um, Laura by chance and uh, Rajkumar and Gurridge. I don't, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. You could correct me, please. Um, feel free to click on the link, sorry, click on the link um, in the chat. And um, so I could see responses in the PowerPoint, right? So everyone is comfortable with using those educational tools. All right, good, so far so good, guys. What are some hindrances or issues you faced in using the technologies um, in your educational context? Somebody said learning the features on the fly. Yes, which, which is why training is so important. All right, it's always better to know in advance and to be comfortable with it before you go in front of your students and try to figure out, you know, in front of everybody to, to figure out how to use the technologies and so on, yeah? Anybody else? Did you encounter problems with access, with, okay, bandwidth, students did not have, did not all have access to, to the technology and or internet, I would assume. Yeah. All right? Yeah. That's a good, that's a good one. That's a very, um, a very important um, or relevant point, I should say. Now, in cases like that, and sometimes it could be, right, somebody said in internet connectivity as well. Um, I know that the Department for Student Services, DSSD, they normally provide some support um, as far as um, access to different hardware, yeah? Um, and I'm sure you would have heard of the initiative the campus, you know, the campus has taken in some regards to basically rent out or loan um, laptops and those sorts of things. For teaching mathematics, writing formulae, and the lack of interaction with students was an issue. Yes, yes. Because very often, and I'm saying we because, you know, it's just the community of us. Um, we often tend to, we, we, we tend to just go online, whether it's on Blackboard, Collaborate, Zoom, or, or even Skype, or whatever platform, and we could talk up a storm, you know what I mean? And it's sometimes very, you know, 
a colleague and I used to call it snooze fest or talk fest. And that's something that you probably don't want because, you, you know, especially in the online environment, you already have that, um, that you're not able to see your students. So you're not even aware of, you know, to read their body language, to see if they're falling asleep, to see if they're even paying attention. You could be, they could be, you know, your, the, the, the session could be on and they could be in the kitchen washing dishes and you not know. You know what I mean? So that is something to, to consider. Um, internet. So this is why engagement in the online and in an environment such as this is important. Again, internet connectivity and inability to stream videos. That is very, very, very um, relevant. Um, the good thing with Zoom, I would say, is Zoom has a very one of the more stable applica uh, mobile applications compared to other platforms like, well, Skype has a mobile application too, but compared to other platforms such as Blackboard Collaborate, uh, Zoom has a fairly stable, um, a fairly stable mobile app. So even if they don't have uh, Wi-Fi or internet, you know, connection per se, um, of course, the next um, avenue would probably be to put a plan on their phone or to, to go somewhere where you could get Wi-Fi on your phone, even if not, if not a whole laptop, yeah? Because more people probably have phones now than they have laptops or tablets as opposed to laptops or desktops. So that is a good um, advantage in using Zoom. All right, so let's go to the next question. Have you ever used Zoom? 80% of, of you guys said yes, 20% said no. Right. Um, so good. And even and I would rec I would venture to say that of that eighty percent, based on the previous responses, um, the eighty percent includes persons who had limited access. Yeah. Yes. Right. So um, so yeah, and I saw a response in the chat um, to teach mathematics and write equations and so on. Yes, that is true. Now, there are diff I, I know I'm digressing a little bit, but in terms of, because um, this was just a quick, this session is just designed to give you a quick overview of Zoom um, and some of the different things that, the basic things that you could do in Zoom. Um, now, there are different um, plans you could have with Zoom, and you'll see, I might mention it later on in this session. Um, you have like an education plan, you have, so for example, the education plan, may provide you with the opportunity to have breakout rooms. Some of us would know breakout rooms in Blackboard Collaborate, but now Zoom also has breakout rooms. Um, depending on the plan, you know, it might be available to you. Most of the licenses we have on this, and as far as I know, in the, in the university, we don't really have the education, the educational um, licenses. So you may not necessarily get um, the breakout rooms and so on. All right, unless your plan is configured accordingly. So that's that. Um, in terms of teaching mathematics or writing equations, um, there's also a whiteboard feature in Zoom that could allow that. It's similar to Blackboard, like I said. Um, so that is one thing that, that may work for you. Another thing would be to, if you have an application, I would recommend like an application where you, a similar whiteboard, virtual whiteboard application on your, device, such as a desktop or your, or your tablet or whatnot. Um, yes, yes. I was now going to say you could share your screen and that kind of thing. Now, um, to have a stylus, now it depends, you know, um, if you have a stylus and your device is, is, um, has that touch screen feature, it may make it a little better for you. I'm not saying it solves the problem. But it, you know, it may be a little untidy, but at least there is some capability there. Um, I would recommend even doing it. Now, if you're going to write an equation incrementally um, and solve that equation and so on, it may be a bit of a challenge. One avenue you can take would be to do it somehow through um, a PowerPoint, all right? when you share your PowerPoint and you can have little, not transitions, animations or whatnot to have things added incrementally to that equation. So that's another avenue you can take. If it's something where students have to solve that equation in real time, 
then I would recommend that you put it in a sort of activity sheet where they can um, do the needful and then perhaps um, do it in groups, all right? And then have them, or even individually, depending on how large your class is, and then have them share it, um, share their screen or use their video or whatnot, all right? So those, I'm not saying it's a perfect uh, uh, one size fits all kind of thing. It's just some, these are, those are just some avenues or alternatives that you could use based on the limitations that we have. Exactly, exactly. You could use your camera. I like that Lystra as well. Um, but I, I didn't mention that because I know not everyone has, um, you know, one of those high-end cameras. But if you have a, a camera that could clearly, um, that students could clearly see what you're writing and whatnot on, on your board and so on, then that works as well. But that would be more of a, um, if you use your, you know, it, it, it could be a little more complicated to you to do that because you're probably going to need either someone to hold your camera or a tripod and um, you teach, to record you teaching on the board, all right? In a case like that, I would recommend you use some sort of pre-recorded um, approach, all right? So if it's a pre, you know, like when you go on YouTube to see how, to, same thing, to solve an equation, it's the same way they do it. It's just, well, one of the ways they do it. You might have a camera just facing the board and the, and the instructor and you are writing on the board and solving that equation. And then you just take that, that recording, you can place it into YouTube or even your Google Drive. So it's just a link you're gonna get from that. And then you post that link into my e-learning. So that's just, I'm just offering alternatives, all right? Um, so yeah, so those hopefully, hopefully that help, that's of, of, of use to you, Lystra and others. Um, Exactly, it is not interactive. What I would recommend with that Lystra is probably to, you show, you demonstrate how to solve a particular equation and then build or do some sort of follow-up activity where the students now have to go and solve a similar equation. You may even give them that equation to go and apply to a different context or to tweak accordingly. And then they have to now submit that, not necessarily as an assignment, but even in a discussion forum in my learning. Yeah? All right, no problem. So those are just some tips, are just just some some advice or, or whatnot to help um, adjust <laughs> in such a trying time. All right. I was hearing a microphone just now. Is every, is that a question? Okay, I think we're good. All right, so we're just gonna go straight ahead. Um, so we have some objectives that um, are guiding this session today. Um, so you're gonna learn these, you're gonna be able, by the end of the session, you, I want you to be able to um, at least identify the steps in creating a Zoom session. Now let me back up a little bit. This session, <laughs> Marshall might be laughing. This session <laughs> was intended to be a very small session um, with just a handful of, of, of instructors and so on, like about five or six or something like that. Um, and so it expanded <laughs> to a larger session. So, um, so what we had to do was revise the approach a bit, the delivery, and it's gonna be more of a show and tell, um, more than anything else. And of course, following this session, we can do some more, some, some, smaller um, clinics, if you will, all right? So I can show you and walk you through more specifically or more uh, basically to meet your, your specific needs. This will be something that is more generic, for lack of a better word, um, and to, to be, it's just a general orientation to Zoom. So you'll be able to create this, to identify the steps in creating a Zoom session. Um, you're going to describe the ways in which you can engage students, and I'm so happy that that was mentioned before in terms of the different ways that you can engage students. So what I'll be doing is, um, now you would notice these three objectives basically address the before, the during, and the after. So before your session, what are some of the things that you need to do? And hopefully I'll hear from you guys in terms of how you plan to incorporate Zoom. Is it that 
um, you'll have one person create like a, a technician, an AV person to create the, the, the links, right? And send it to the different lecturers and so on. Or is it that the lecturers are, in, are supposed to create those links or they have access to this one account? I know each department or faculty is supposed to have at least one Zoom license or account, yeah? So that was the clarity, I guess. And, and you could share with me as we go further. Um, and then during, in terms of the actual presentation now, or Zoom session, we're gonna look at ways in which um, some presentation protocols, basic presentation protocols in Zoom, um, and some of the ways in which you can engage students and get their, their participation in the session. And then after we're gonna look at how you can access the recording, all right? I forgot to mention recording the session is also part of that middle, that middle part of the equation, for lack of a better word. <laughs> and, um, and then at the end, we're gonna look at how we can access the Zoom recording, review it, and then share it, all right? So to give you a better idea, these are some of the topics that we're gonna look at um, to guide our session. So like I said, it's gonna be um, basically before, during, and after. So we're gonna look at setting up a Zoom session, inviting participants to a session, um, beginning it, beginning the session and so on. And of course, activities for engagement and then sharing the recording, all right? So let's go straight into it. So right off the bat, and I think this is where you can tell me, um, how is Zoom being managed in your particular department or faculty? Is it that you have one account for the entire faculty or, or department, or is it that each lecturer is supposed to have, for example, a free account, a, a plan, et cetera? So some, anybody could tell me, I guess, Marsha might be the best. Right, so one account for the department, good, which is what I figured. So when you are trying to, when you, would, when you are using Zoom, is it that one person creates the, the link? Okay, great. So um, I guess that person who would be the host would just send you the link for your particular class, correct? Right, and list you, and you would be, that person would list you as a co-host or, or an actual, or the, or the host of the session and so on. So good. So that takes, so that might mean we could move a little more quickly in this regard. Um, I'll still go over it, go over some of these, the things here, just so you know for your, for your benefit, so you see what happens in the back end of it. Um, there are some things that you could set when creating your session that you may or may not be interested in, all right? So I'm just kind of giving you a quick orientation to that as well, all right? So right off the bat, like I said, you're gonna need a Zoom account, all right? Um, and I mentioned earlier, there are different types of Zoom accounts or plans, more specifically. Um, so for example, you have the education plan, which would allow you a couple more features, yeah? Such as the breakout rooms and so on. And you, would be, you should be familiar with the way breakout rooms may look like um, based on Blackboard. And of course, um, you're gonna need the host, right? Um, whoever that, let's say the AV, uh, rep or person who's creating the session, um, you would also need to be listed as the, as the co-host. Without being listed as a co-host in this regard, and this point is very important since you wouldn't be creating the session, um, it's very important that the person who's creating the sessions um, identify you as a host or co-host. Because without that, you cannot do you, you can't do anything. You can't share your screen, you can't share your presentation, you can't record the session, you can't um, mute other persons, microphones and so on. You know, you, it basically um, gives you the privileges of a, of a student, all right? So you would need to get that, um, that listing, all right? So keep that in mind. So whenever you're doing your first Zoom session, make sure you are identified by the host as a co-host at least, all right? And I would recommend that you, um, 
don't go into if it's your, especially if it's your first Zoom session, try not to do it alone. <laughs> try not to do it alone because it could be very um, especially if you have a large class, it could be very very. You could get flustered quite easily, yeah. Especially if you're trying to figure figure it out in front of your students. So once you are into Zoom, now the the the, the, the host is probably going to share. Um, well, obviously, he's going to share this link with you. If you are accessing it, now you can access your Zoom session um, via a desktop or via a mobile device, such as a tablet, a, an iPad, um, a media pad, or even your phone. All right? And yes, you could present from your phone as well. Um, once you have all your, you know, your documents, your PowerPoint, and so on there, but it's probably not the most comfortable and reliable thing to do. It's better to get a direct connection, all right? Internet connection. So basically, the way it works in the back end would be you have the, the departmental account. Um, whoever the person is, and is the person here by chance, the person who is responsible for creating the, the sessions? No? OK, that's OK. But at least you, I, I'm just saying so you would know. So that person would need to, you can schedule all your classes in advance, all right? So it doesn't have to be that every week you have to run down this person to get this link. There are several things I want you to note here. You can um, have the meeting, you can have one link for your meeting, and that link can be set to be a recurring meeting or a recurring session. So every Monday at 4 p.m., 4 to 6 p.m., you know that link, is gonna to open to your room for your session, right? So I would, rec I would recommend using, taking that approach that you set all your, t your class times in advance. And so whoever's creating it in the back end can just create the links for all the courses, all the you know, meetings, all the courses, sorry, and set those links as recurring meetings, yeah? So keep that in mind. Right, um, and that way it makes it easier to manage. It makes it easier. It's less stress on you to go and run down and every week you have to ask for a new link. You can just use the same link for the entire semester once it's set as a recurring meeting. It'll be scheduled in advance, of course, so you wouldn't have to worry about it. But I would recommend too that you test it to make sure. All right. So basically, the the whoever's doing it is gonna schedule your meeting all right let's say for example the topic could be the course code it doesn't necessarily have to be the module you're doing or the, the specific topic but it can be the general um the general course code all right you may not you don't have to give it a description as well that is optional the main thing is that you set the duration um which of course the time the date the time the duration and remember I said earlier, if you need to identify if it's a recurring meeting, all right, this is, this is the, the, whoever's creating those meetings will have to click this. And that way, every Thursday at, at, at 6 p.m., right, you're gonna have to, to, you're gonna use that same link instead of trying to search for another link or search for the technician to make that link all over again, all right? The next thing is, the registration. Um, I'm not sure if you need to necessarily do that um, because you know it's students that you will have. I'm assuming that that link may be placed in, in my learning. If you don't have access to my learning, you're probably going to have to um, send it, send the link via email, and I'll show you what the invitation looks like and what is the main information you'll need to copy and send to your students. All right. Um, each meeting has a particular ID. That ID is important. So for example, if a student is trying to join the session without using the link, they might be using just a phone or a desktop, they can use a meeting ID instead of the link to join your session. I would recommend, however, that maybe uh, you may or may not want to use this a password, implementing a password. Um, that is up to you. Um, of course, because it's a recurring meeting, I'm not sure if you would really want to use a password because, like I said, it's a recurring meeting. 
Um, but try not to do it alone. As you know, Zoom hasn't, it hasn't been, hasn't had the best time over the past few months. <laughs> it's actually good, you know, under a court case right now um, for various reasons. Um, and well, you wouldn't, you would have heard any news that you have the, the, the instances where persons would, um, I want to say hack into, into a meeting and put up uh, explicit material, yeah? And basically hijack the entire session. So you wanna be very mindful of that, all right? So why I'm saying, in, in addition to you being able to manage your classroom in the online environment, especially the first couple of times, um, you would also have sort of an assistant, somebody to assist, who will be able to um, ensure that students join with their real names and not pseudonames, you know, like, um, you know, some people have these, <laughs> these very unprofessional names like TickSource 101 and, you know, all these different things. No, you want them to put their real name um, so you will be able to identify the students that are supposed to be there and eliminate the outliers, yeah? Marsha said we will have a link for course. Okay, good. So in a case like that, Marsha, perfect. So in a case like that, I think the different lecture, once it, they have the same lecture link per course, that works, right? That works. And um, just make sure that once the different lecturers are all identified as hosts in those meetings, in those sessions, all right? So for example, um, you may have Sharman doing a session this week, but then when Marsha or Lystra go the following week, they can't do anything because they are not listed as a host. So I think a good um, takeaway here would be to have a comprehensive list of all the, the facilitators or lecturers and so on, or instructors, and um, the different courses or sessions, and then have them as a host, yeah? So just a tidbit going forward. Um, so yes, as we continue here, I think you might want, to, and I think hopefully your technician, your technician would be aware of all of these things. Um, you probably want to mute your participants upon entry. That way you don't get all the background noises, the, the dogs barking, the rooster crowing, <laughs> you know, these different things. Um, the enable join before host means that students can join ahead of the, 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 ahead of the beginning of the session which is probably something you might want to implement because um, persons who might have technical difficulties, they could iron out those things before the actual start of your session. All right. Um, this particular button here, the last one, well, second to last one, record the meeting automatically. All right. Um, this, um, I, I think you should leave this unticked. The reason I'm saying that is because you want to, I would think you would want to manually click record, right? You don't want to do it as soon as you join the session because what is going to happen is all the little pre-conversations and, and setting up and the kinks and so on that you're trying to iron out, it's going to be recorded as soon as you enter that room and then you have to click stop or pause or whatever, you know, and then it's going to save and you don't want all of that. So, um, so you could hit, like what I did just now, I went at the beginning of this session, I manually clicked the record button. The second thing you want to know, and I'll get back to this part, is if you want the recording to be stored on your device, whether it's your desktop or tablet or whatever, or in the cloud via a Zoom account. Keep in mind, however, and this, let me know if, and I'll ask for some responses because I find some of you are kind of quiet. <laughs> Um, so, yes, yeah, so um, if it's on your local computer, by all means, it's yours, it's, you know, it's, it's, it'll be stored on your machine, all right? If it's in the cloud, however, it will go back to the host, whoever's managing the departmental account, all right? And I reckon that you'll probably need the recording to maybe post in my learning or send to students one way or the other so they could review and so on. Right, so that is managed by the IT department, good. So I'm just saying those things to kind of get that out of the way. Um, 
And of course, you see at the bottom here, you need to be identified as alternative hosts. So this is the invitation, right? So the technician will be dealing with all of this. So no need to deal to go too much in depth with that. Um, any questions so far with regard to Yes, yes. This, this, this is an example here. So you have access to this recording. Um, it's probably going to be sent via email. <laughs> so we're kind of modeling what you will be doing to your students as well. All right. Um, good. So any other questions, guys? Great, great. So we could go forward just to kind of give you a checkpoint. So we looked at the before, which is really more the technician part of it. And I guess you making special requests where necessary. All right. Um, if you want the recording for you know to be stored on your desktop or your machine, as opposed as opposed to the technician storing it on on the on the cloud. All right. So it's up to you. Just things to consider. So we're going to move forward into the actual delivery of the session. Um, and see, I told you it would be very 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 quick. Not so. All right, so the first thing you want to do is open up your, I'm assuming most of you would have a PowerPoint or a document of some sort that you want to share during your session, correct? Right. Now, while you respond to that, you could continue responding. Zoom wasn't originally designed as a platform for virtual learning. It was, more, it was more designed for video or virtual conferencing. So for example, staff meetings, remote staff meetings, um, you know, those kinds of things, almost like a Skype, so to speak, all right? But it has evolved now into an education, <clears throat> a platform that could be integrated into um, either emergency remote teaching and learning or distance education, all right? But it's not a first, a first, a top of the list, so to speak thing. You know, most institutions may use it to get by and so on, but it's not. Good question, Ronald. Is it preferred over BBC? I would say it's an alternative. Let me tell you why, right? The BBC is designed for virtual teaching and learning. Right, so you would notice the features in, in, in Blackboard include the breakout rooms, include the polls, include the, and they've all, you know, for the most part, they include those things, timers. Um, so if you have students who might need to do a presentation in the session, you could time those presentations. Um, they have, of course, the whiteboard and all these other things that Zoom is kind of slowly but surely getting, expanding to, <clears throat> right? So, when it comes to teaching and learning, Blackboard has been the go-to among several other platforms, similar platforms. Um, Zoom, however, has always traditionally, I should say, been used for virtual meetings. Yes, so Zoom is slowly but surely getting there. Because let's face it, at our version of Blackboard versus Zoom, you know, the, the Zoom platform is a little more stable in the sense that you're not gonna get the access issues per se, yeah? And those of you who have used both platforms, you know what I'm talking about, whether it's access to my e-learning, and I think that's why um, some of the administrators in your department um, have indicated the, the, the going, that they're going the Zoom route because it's, it's not everyone has access to my e-learning, all right? And you need to do your session. So, um, and Blackboard is housed in our My Learning platform. So, so that is, <laughs> the match is <laughs> exactly. So that is why we decided to do this particular session. This, that's why this session was requested because, um, and thanks Marsha for that, because um, it's something that is necessary, um, especially as a workaround to the situations that we are facing in terms of not just the remote education, not just the COVID, the pandemic, but also the need to continue with your work <laughs> during such, you know, different, su such, such, um, such times. All right. So yeah, 
So you want to make sure that um, you have your Zoom, sorry, your, your documents prepared ahead of time. I think that goes without saying. It's, I think, no, before I go back there, it was answering Ronald's question. Exactly, for part-time instructors who, and I know part-time instructors tend to have difficulty, um, and I'm trying to be diplomatic, difficulty accessing my learning and it's not necessarily on their part it's more so on the administrative systems and so on all right so and uh, so trust me i totally i'm well aware and i understand that the struggle is real all right so this is just a workaround so to answer your question again ronald um for teaching and learning um blackboard has certain features that um, are specifically designed for virtual teaching and learning. But it's, it could be a little clunky. It has certain limitations. It could be a little glitchy. If it's a large group, then at least the, the, the license that we have in our, our university. If it's a large class of, let's say, 200 students, then certain features are no longer functional or, or, or you know, then some persons can't access the session, etc. With Zoom, now, with different plans or licenses, you have certain limitations. Um, I'm not sure what your departmental limit might be, but your technician will be able to give you some advice on that. Now, yes, with the, with the even with, I'm reading Ronald, even with access, BBC, though it's technically more suitable. Yes, 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 definitely. With Zoom, however, Zoom, I mean, has one of the best mobile platform, mobile applications, um, mobile conferencing applications, so to speak. So let's say a student doesn't have a, a, a laptop or a desktop. They can, most students have a smartphone now. So they can easily access it through most smartphones, not all, but most, all right? Um, so that is, with Blackboard, it could be a little clunky to access on a mobile device. It's not necessarily built for being a mobile application. So if you weigh the pros and cons, Zoom is probably more, you know, sorry, Blackboard is more, they have more of a hands-on kind, when I say hands-on, a stronger foot um, in the virtual teaching and learning um, delivery. But Zoom has a stronger foot in access in terms of having a more stable um, mobile application, all right? And of course, there are a host of, there are a whole, a lot more um, pros and cons, but those are just some of them that I just highlighted. So, <clears throat> so that's that. So when you want to do a presentation, so let's say you got the invitation, you're about to begin your session. The first thing you want to do is pull up your PowerPoint. All right, you pull up your PowerPoint, and I would recommend you go into, into presentation mode, if it's a PowerPoint, or full screen mode. Um, you know, so you do that. And one trick I'll teach you this is something that you can use. It's a sort of a combination hotkey. Whenever you click the Alt uh, button on your keyboard and tab, it allows you to see all the pages you have open up. See, I'm not sure if you can see it on mine. Yeah. So when I need to navigate, even though I'm in presentation mode, every time I click, once my, my one of my fingers is on the Alt button, which is next to the, the space key, <clears throat> the space bar, and every time you click Tab, it's going to take you to another window that you have open. So that is what I use to navigate between the actual Zoom platform and the presentation. So I don't miss too much. All right, so that's, I guess, trick number two <laughs> that, I, that I was just trying to show you there. So keep that in mind, right? Alt and, and Tab. Um, I think for Mac users, I think you have the Alt key. I, I have a Mac, but I can't remember what the keypad is what that button is right next to the, the space bar, but it's usually on the left of the space bar. All right. You can take a try now on, on, your, on your machines and see if it works. It's just, you click Alt and Tab together 
And every time you right, mark is command. I wasn't sure if it's command or if it's um uh, that other button. But yeah, so once you click that and tab, um, you could try it now. I'll give you a couple seconds to try it. And you would notice every time you click on tab, it goes to a new page. That <laughs> no problem, Raj Kumar. So that is something I learned, well not learned, sorry. That is something I use to navigate between the presentation and the platform, right? Um, another thing where, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, um, when you go to, when you begin your session, you wanna make, and you go into full screen mode, all right? Um, you wanna make sure that you can, you can see the chat. In Zoom, and I'll explain it in just a bit. If not, somebody could please, please, please remind me. In Zoom, it's very easy to do. Right now, I could see the chat, but I can also pay attention to my presentation. All right? So you could hear me, and you can see the presentation, but I can also see you through the chat. All right? And I'll explain that in just a bit. If I forget, just somebody feel free to just message me in the chat. All right? So yes. So of course, you know, when you get your link um, from your, your technician, you can do a couple, in this case, you're gonna click the link because the link is, you see this little thing that, um, let me go back. This, you would, you're gonna get this from your technician. This thing with, you'll see the topic, the join Zoom, basically the same thing that I sent for you for this particular thing. Join Zoom meeting, that link is important. Meeting ID, passcode if necessary. Those are the main things that you're gonna need for your session to actually start the room, to open the room for students to join, et cetera, et cetera. All right? So you may not have to click start meeting because you are not the host, well, you're the co-host, but you will probably just need to click on the link, okay? So let me just go back to this. All right, so moving forward. Um, so once you click the link, you're gonna ask, you're gonna be asked to insert, um, maybe a name, um, it could be your name, but in this case, to join the meeting, it depends on the, the settings that the technician creates um, or implements. You're gonna have to insert the, remember I just told about the meeting ID and the password, that is what you're gonna have to create. Of course, it depends on how this is set by the technician. All right, so I'm just telling you because if it happens, I don't want you to be um, shook, all right, or get nervous or afraid. It just means that you're just gonna look, go back to the invitation that the technician sent. You're gonna see the meeting ID and the password. All right, and you just copy and paste it, okay? And then you just click join the meeting. Now, by the time you join the meeting, um, of course, it's gonna be, it's, it's not, we just said it wouldn't be recording automatically, hopefully, all right? Um, but you'll be, you'll be prompted to check your video and audio. I'm sure you had to do it like for this session, not so? If you're joining from a mobile device, it allows you to join by internet or join via video or something like that, audio. Yeah? You could tell me in the chat. Right, right, Prof said yes. Anybody else? It wasn't just like Blackboard where you could just join, bam, and you're in. You had to make sure your video and your, your audio <clears throat> um, were all spot on. All right, um, like I said before, if you're gonna present using a document, a PowerPoint or whatnot, you wanna open it separately. And even like I said before, you join the Zoom session. All right, um, so now we're gonna take it to the point where you are in the Zoom session, all right? And then you're gonna, the first thing you wanna do is go to your opening slide in your PowerPoint if that's what you're using. And you're going to slide your mode on that. And then you click share screen. All right, so having checked all the audio and things as you see in the graphic here, all right, you have join audio. If you want to start video, now let me back up a little bit <laughs> with start video. You wanna be very careful with that, all right? Sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes you might be prompted, you, well, you might wanna show your face and whatnot and so students can see you in addition to the presentation and so on. 
which is all well and good, but I wouldn't recommend that you require students to share their video. All right? Because it's gonna take up more bandwidth. It's gonna be very choppy or glitchy, um, especially if they don't have a good network connection. So sharing video, even for you, um, your presentation is gonna be very choppy, especially because it's more stress on, the, on, on your network, on your, on your bandwidth and so on. So I would recommend if you have a PowerPoint or a document or whatnot that you're a visual, so to speak, then you don't need to share your video. All right? Is that, is that okay? We understand, right? Um, so with that out of the way, it's really your visual is gonna be a PowerPoint or whatever document you wanna illustrate. Um, and then you go to, you click share screen. You click share screen, which is this green button. If you look at the graphic, share screen. And you're gonna see a window pop up, a pop up window. And it's gonna ask you to basically identify which page you would like to, to share. All right, whether it's a, you might have a YouTube page open, a Facebook page open and all these different things. You wanna go straight to your PowerPoint. Now you might have two versions of your PowerPoint there because remember I said before, you wanna go to your, you wanna put your presentation in slide, your PowerPoint in slideshow mode or presentation mode. So you're gonna click on the one that, that, that has, is, is you're gonna see it in tiles. I know I, I should have put a graphic for this. But you're going to see it in tiles in terms of the different pages that you have open. All right. Um, click on the tile that is all about your presentation, your, your cover sheet, your cover slide, opening slide. All right. You click on that, you click share, and that's it. Any questions on sharing a, a PowerPoint so far? So far, so good, guys. Okay, great. Shaman, no questions. Chirachkuma, no questions. Good. And it's simple so far, right? We, we kind of understand. So if I were to ask you, what are some of the things, and you could list it for me now in the chat, what are some of the things that you need to do um, when you go into a Zoom session? Prepare your PowerPoint, good. Hot, next to, right, load it, good. Check audio, no vid, good. Make sure your PowerPoint is in slideshow mode, remember that. So check audio, no, no video. Click share screen, good. And Charmin went all out. <laughs> Join meet and check audio, possible, possibly video, open PowerPoint, share screen, select full, power, full screen PowerPoint. Good, good. And then record, good, right? Um, so, so far, so good. Um, and I see we have, so you have that feature to write on the PowerPoint on the screen, um, which I was telling you about earlier when we spoke about possibly using <clears throat> that to show, um, writing a mathematical equation or something like that. It's gonna be a little, you know, scribbly, um, and you're probably gonna need a stylus, but a stylus nowadays, you, a stylus is, is fairly cheap or easy to get your hands on. Um, most, in fact, you could get it free in some places. Most pens, for example, come with a stylus, so that would help you um, in that regard. So, that's just something to, to, to put that to the point we made earlier. So going forward. I'm sorry, Justin, one sure. question. Mm -hmm. um, with the stylus, do you need a stylus pad or can, depending on the computer you have, you can write on the screen itself? Right. That's what I was saying earlier. You could write on the screen itself. If it is that you, you have that touch screen feature on your, on your laptop or device, you can use the stylus and just, it doesn't have to be, you know, some machines come with a specific stylus. Yeah, you may not necessarily need it in this particular instance. Okay. 
Thanks. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> so that makes it a little easier for you when you need to, it might, you may not just have to show a, 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 a what you call it, a mathematical equation. You might want to draw something or ask the students to draw something to illustrate a particular diagram. Or oh, sorry, to, um, to draw a particular, sketch a particular diagram of some sort or make an illustration, right? And this is one way you could engage your students too. Sometimes you could ask students to scribble, or not scribble, but to draw something on the screen based on what you just covered or some of the steps that you are highlighting. Yeah? So if, let me just go out on a, on a, a, go off on a tangent here. If I were to ask you to, you could draw it anywhere on this pulp or on this page. Um, uh, draw, a, what is something that you normally draw in your particular department? You could tell me a soil profile or a tree. Let's say a tree. <clears throat> Yeah. Let me see what you come up with. I, I, I will tell you about it in a little bit, but you, 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 let me see what you come up with. Because I saw some people drawing, not so. How oh, do you do that on the share screen? Right. So <laughs> I, was, I was just going to see if you, if, if somebody, because I saw people drawing. So what you need to do is you would see, right, some people are doing it good. You go on, I think you should have it, you should see annotate. I think it should be either on the lower menu or the menu at the top of the screen. You can place the cursor straight to the top of the screen and let me know if you see annotate. If not, it will be at the bottom of the screen. You just place the cursor all the way down. I don't see annotate. No? I'm Anybody? seeing mm -hmm. video, participants, chat, share, screen, record, leave. And that's at the bottom. Are you seeing yeah. anything at the top of the screen? At the top of? At when the you top of the screen, I'm seeing you're viewing Zoom view options. Oh. oh I see annotate now. I right. see annotate now. Okay. Right. There you should see it. Right. So I'm seeing different versions of trees. <laughs> I think you guys are enjoying this. <laughs> right. <clears throat> go ahead. You, now, what I want you to do now is go on text and type your name on the tree that you drew. I'm seeing three or four or five trees. So type your name. Now, when you click annotate, you're going to see a sort of ribbon. It's almost like a Word document. So you're going to see the 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 text, you're going to see the draw option, you're going to see the eraser. So I'm going to give you a, just about a minute or a couple of seconds to, to do that. So I see Laura. Okay, your tree is pretty good. Oh, Laura, you drew two trees. <laughs> Shaman, that's a very small tree, but it looks almost like a um, prof, you want to specify what you want to take a shot at what tree that is that Shaman drew in the red. It looks like um, a pine, uh, or what is it, the official name of the Christmas tree? Um, a conifer. Ah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, Raj, you drew that. Okay, good. All right, so we see, and I'm seeing some equations, y equal, oh, somebody just erased it. So x2, x squared, sorry, plus y squared, Plus, I think my annotation is blocking it a bit, but right. So, so you see, this is one way that you could get. Now, what I try to do in a case like this, let me just finish that thought. To really engage students or, or participants, I try to um, leave a blank slide and just put the instruction at the top of the slide. So, for example, where you are seeing the header on my slide, I will just put the instructions, okay draw or um, list some of the things that came to mind, depending on topic, of course, some of the, the things that came to <coughs> mind with um, technology, 
some of the, the problems you encountered with technology in your context, all right? And then persons will just take the text button, will annotate text, those are the two steps, two buttons, and then they write their responses. All right? Now notice one of the advantages here is that the font size is a lot bigger than what you see in Blackboard. And I'm com com I'll be comparing it to Blackboard occasionally just because that is something some of us might be familiar with, some of you might be familiar with. So yeah, so the font size is a lot bigger than what you would see than the default in Blackboard Collaborate. So I could actually see exactly what Laura, what is Laura's, <laughs> what are her, her graphics. <laughs> And somebody went even bigger, Department of Mathematics and Statistics. There you go. With Blackboard, you don't get to, to, to tweak your text to that degree. It's a one size fits all. All right. Now, you could even, in addition to drawing, in addition to writing or typing, um, you can erase things. You can um, add a spotlight to certain things. All right. So for example, let's say I'm typing something here, right? So that gives a nice little, right? You could do that. Um, somebody's typing Y. And as a teacher, as a facilitator, I'm gonna clear all now just so you know you have, <laughs> you could clear different, um, different annotations along the way. You could clear all drawings. You can clear all of the, these, the participants' drawings or text or whatever they write in there. And you can clear your drawings alone. So let's say, for example, you place certain guidelines on the, on the thing as, as, you know, on that blank slide. Then um, after that, you could take off your drawings and just leave it as students filling the when students have already filled in their pieces. Or Sharmin, you are not seeing annotate? Or is that? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. I think you saw it, right? I think I saw right. it. Right. Great. Great. So I <laughs> see everyone is having fun with um, the, the annotation features. Any questions on that? <laughs> so let's so let's see what an equation would look like. I, I think we were drawing it earlier. Some some people were trying to draw equations or write equations. This wasn't planned, but I'm just doing it because I know it's something that came up <clears throat> earlier in the session. So you go ahead. You're just gonna click. Remember, it's just annotate all right it's annotate and then you're going to see the little ribbon with the rest of the menu all right and you could draw your, you could draw your equation which might be a very um like i said um it may not be the 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 cleanest um, version if it is you don't have a stylus um, but it's something that you could work with I would recommend when you when you are using this feature that you leave a blank um, slide all right and you can build that into your PowerPoint leave a blank slide in your PowerPoint if you have a question or, or an equation that students have to solve just place the equation at the top of the arm as best as you know as readably possible but not too big to take up the entire slide um, and then they can work it out either just underneath that equation or next to that equation. All right. I think Laura and everyone else and Raj and right. So no questions. Okay, good, good. So I mean, we jumped ahead there, but it was something that I think we needed to, to cover. Now, in some instances, oh, I see zero. Oh, <laughs> right, somebody's deleting it. Okay, fair enough. Um, no, no, 
Good question, Rudy. The annotate feature, you could do it on a PDF or any document, a Word document that you're sharing. So let's say you pulled up a graphic, all right? Um, let's see, I was gonna do it now, but I don't wanna kinda throw it off. But um, let's say you pull up a, 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 an illustration of some sort, a graph, um, a, a, a process of some sort, all right? And you want to highlight certain components of that process, that, that um, certain steps in that process. Um, you could put annotations or you could let the students highlight those things, the annotation, make annotations to that graphic, right? So for example, look at this. I mean, this is a PowerPoint thing, but this is a, this is a, a graphic at the bottom here that I placed on to my PowerPoint. You could make your, your little annotations there, right? Or students could do the same. Um, so that's why I'm saying that you could use the annotation as a really, um, it's a really effective tool to engage your students, to get them to be involved, to be, um, to actively participate, to become a part of the teaching and learning process. All right. Definitely, definitely. So no problem, but no problem really. All right. One thing I like to do is sometimes if I have text on a slide, I might ask the students to, I might ask certain questions, key questions that will guide them, right? Um, to identify some of the things along the way. So if I ask you to, let's make an example. Um, if I wanted to record this session, what should I do? Identify by making an annotation, of course. You show me, so what would I do? Or if I were to say, what is the first thing that um, what is the first prompt I'll receive upon joining somebody circle very good, somebody circle record here, the icon, very good. And what, if I were to ask you, what is the first thing that, that I'll be prompted to do um, when I'm joining my Zoom session? There we go, right? Somebody else could show it via the text, what, what, in the PowerPoint, the, PowerPoint text by underlining it or something, circling it, or placing an arrow or something. Right, there, there we go, right? So you see how it, you, you could, <laughs> I'm seeing several different arrows and so on, good. So yeah, so this is a way of getting students, so you don't have to do any talking, you could get students to almost like you pose the problem and they could highlight what is wrong in the process, what, co you know, co a correlation kind of thing, they could highlight that there by just using the annotations, all right? And yes, Laura, you could have them put it in the, in the chat, but it's a lot more engaging for them to use the annotation features, all right? So good, 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 good stuff, guys. So we're gonna move on now. All right, let me just close this, good. So in some instances, um, well, before I even get to that, um, this is just to kind of highlight how to record a session. And um, I'm glad that Prof mentioned record session too. Of course, she was answering the question, but um, that's a nice segue into this <laughs> particular slide. Now, when you record a session, some things I wanna highlight. Um, and this is another thing where it's different from Blackboard. You can, of course, you're gonna see the record button close to the, the, at the bottom half of the, the end of your screen, right? Just where you see your audio buttons, your audio and video buttons, you're gonna see record session, usually on the other end, on the right side, so to speak, close to the middle. Um, you click on that, and the thing that's different from this compared to Blackboard collaborators that it allows for you to it allows you to pause or to stop the recording blackboard will only allow you to stop the recording yeah this one would allow you to pause and continue now consider i'm, I'm throwing out a question here consider what 
benefits this could provide for you and your students? Somebody could tell me. I think Prof should know, <laughs> should know what I'm talking about because we had to do it a couple times. How much space in terms of, how much space in terms of what uh, Right, Charmin mentioned, take a break. Good, good. You could take a break. Um, this provides an even, well, a take a break if you're doing a synchronous session, a real time session with everybody. You could give them a five minute break or a 10 minute break to go and, you know, stretch your legs, grab something to eat, grab some water or something, and then, you know, that sort of thing. Exactly, if you need to record something that is relevant, there's some things that, you know, you may not want recorded sensitive information, for example, if it's something that um, is personal to either you or a student, you might want to pause the recording. Yeah? Think of it when you have to do asynchronous teaching and learning. What are you going to do then? Are you seeing where I'm thinking? No? Okay, good, right. You might want to do over the recording on a slide, Prof said. You may want to add or delay information. True, true. You may want but to ask questions and, um, you know, to find out what the students respond, but you don't want other students later on in another session to hear the answers. Oh, yes, that is so, that is, <laughs> that is so, I didn't think of that. That is so true. Definitely, definitely, definitely. I like that. And I think I'm going to take that approach to <laughs> and advise other persons to do the same. So good stuff. But think of too when you want to pre-record your session, your lectures. Yeah. If you have, for example, you're in a situation where um, for whatever reason you need to do a pre-recording of your particular lecture and you want to take that asynchronous approach. So it's not real time. And granted, you know, you have the interaction and so on to deal with, that's the next issue. But if you wanted to do a pre-recording of your lecture, you just want something quick, very quick and short and concise and precise and sweet. Let's say you wanna make a, after doing a whole session, you realize that students are still, you know, you're not too sure if students really understand that particular concept or that particular equation. All right, you might want to do just a quick little screencast, so to speak. Um, to recap or to, re, to, 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 to reiterate certain principles, right? And this is a good thing that would help you to pause, catch your breath, or, you know, take your time with the presentation. So you don't have to necessarily do all in one, in a whole 10 or 15 minute session. You could, uh, well, screencast, you could do it incrementally. You could do it, you could pause it, come back, that kind of thing. All right, so it gives you some sort of editing privileges, so to speak. I mean, it's not really editing privileges, but at least you could pause along the way. With Blackboard, if you make a mistake, you just have to continue, <laughs> yeah? With this one, it gives you a little more, exactly, Marsha, flexibility, all right? So if you have to do a pre-recorded lecture, <clears throat> you can do that and your voice may not be so wholesome or you may not be so wholesome at that particular time to go through a whole two hour lecture, so to speak, but you can do it very quickly um, and pause along the way and so on, if it's pre-recorded, if it's asynchronous. So what I'm trying to say guys is that this feature and this platform thus far as you see, allows for both synchronous and asynchronous um, virtual teaching and learning. All right? And of um, course- just Mm -hmm. Sorry, Justin. Sure. At the bottom of my screen, I'm just seeing record. So to pause it, you just hit record again and it would stop. And then well, you start again? No. Well, for the, for, the partic for the host, right, the host is the one who will be able to record the session. Uh, well, host slash co-host will be able to record the session or pause the recording. Okay. I'm not sure why Zoom has that, that record button for even the participants because Normally when you click it, it allows you to something, I think, to go to the host or something like that, correct? Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, so so that is something you wanna. It, I'm not sure why Zoom has that button there. To be quite honest, it, it um, when you click it, it will. If I remember correctly, it will ask you to refer to the host. Basically, the host will be you in your context, in your teaching context. All right. Um, and to stop the recording, you just click the stop button, and then you end the meeting. I wouldn't recommend ending the meeting without stopping the recording, just to be on the safe side. It's almost like taking your flash drive out without um, closing your documents, right? So you want to keep those things in mind. Now, in some instances, you might have, you might want to let um, give certain privileges to your students. This is another way that you could engage them. All right. Whether it is you can um, have them as the have one or two. Let's say you have a group. You want to use this as a tutorial platform. All right. And students have to make their presentations or to solve a particular equation or whatever the case might be. Um, you may, in some cases, have to make the student or the group or whoever participants as well. All right. The, now, this particular graphic highlights the, um, how to record, how to, how to elevate someone's access or privileges so they can record the session. But I'm saying as well, um, as you see in this lower down in this graphic, you can, them, you can make them the co-host or the host. And that way, so let's say, for example, if I wanted uh, Marsha to, to do a presentation for the rest of this session, then all I have to do is make Marsha the, the co-host. And Marsha will see something on the share screen, et cetera. She would have those privileges to record, to stop the recording, to pause it, to, um, to share a presentation, et cetera. All right? So let's do a little exercise, guys. So let's pretend. In fact, let me revise this a little bit. So, um, Shaman, or anybody for that matter, I would like you to tell me how to make Marsha a co host. Okay, you want to manage participants and you yeah. manage it from there. Um, it gives you a number of choices. Mm -hmm. and you can allow her to record. Right. Or we make her co-host and then she will have those um, features to work with. Right. Correct. Correct. So let me just, so Marshall, I'm going to add you <clears throat> as a co-host and I want you to um, let's see, I want you to Pause the. Should I ask you to pause the recording, boy? No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I, I want you to. Um, okay, we could pause the recording. It'll be the same recording. So, pause the recording. Recording. You'll see the option. It may be at the top menu. Let me know if you see it. Now you could. Oh, you did? Okay, good. Very good. I just saw it. Sorry. So, right. So, Raj just resumed the recording. Good. So, I'm going to ask one more person to do something now. So, um, let me ask. Let's see. I wonder who, who wants to go next. Let's say Lystra. Lystra? Lystra is probably thinking, oh gosh, I hope you don't call me. No, I'm here. I'm here. Yes, I was saying, <laughs> pick somebody else. Pick somebody else. I know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lystra, if yeah. you can, um, would you be able to share your screen for a minute or no? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm going to make you a co host now. Okay. And you should see the, the option to share your screen. All right. While you um, do that, I'll answer a question by Marsha. How many people can be a co-host at the same time? You could have multiple co-hosts. I wouldn't recommend having too many because you want to keep, um, to, to be able to manage your class, especially if you have students there. You don't, know, you don't want students who are 
um, you know, not <laughs> who have ulterior motives and then want to end the session before you are ready to end the session. All right. So I would recommend that you um, keep your co-host to about one or two persons, just so they, you know, if you drop out or have some technical difficulty, you have somebody who can so, sort of hold the fort, so to speak. So right. Justin, I tried to, I, I hit share screen and I got a little dialog box which said host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. Right. So, so that's, that, that's something, let me go back and let me just, uh, hold on one sec, one sec. So I'm just, so let me just finish the point I was making. Yes. So just as you can make persons co-host, co-hosts, sorry, you can withdraw that permission. So okay. Raj, I'm going to withdraw <laughs> your co-host privileges. Is that okay, Raj? All right. So good. So that way, it gives you a little more, um, you're able to manage the extent to which students could control. You give them that level of, of autonomy in the teaching and learning process, but you, um, you give them, you, you know, you, you, you don't have to give, it's not absolute. That's what I'm trying to see. Yeah? So with regard to Lystra, um, you said, the host disabled it. Now I was going to, what you should see actually is the fact that, um, I think that's something I'll have to go into the settings to do, but it's something that um, you would see. If you want to share and somebody else is sharing, then you're gonna have to ask the host for permission. That's what I was getting at, okay. all right? Yeah, so in a case like that, um, you wouldn't be, you, it wouldn't be enabled for you unless I stop sharing, so to speak, right. all right? So, be, so to answer yours and Marsha's question at the same time, um, you can have more than one co-host, but you can't have more than one screen share. Yeah, which makes sense, right? Because the screen share is something that it's your whole screen. All right. Does that answer your question? <clears throat> and I think Lystra, the reason you didn't see it too is because I'm not sure if I was able to make you a co-host. I was talking so much. <laughs> um, so let's try it one okay. more time and you should see something with yes. or let's stop another screen sharing you want to print sure. what are you seeing it now sa it says this will stop another's screen sharing do you uh, want to continue click no please <laughs> <laughs> so that's what i was saying so it'll ask you to because i'm i'm present i'm sharing my screen at the moment right <clears throat> right so this is just to give you a little insight in terms of mm -hmm. what the screen sharing and the permissions aspect is like in, um, in, 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 in Blackboard. Any questions on that? Oh, I'm seeing in the chat, we can also use co-host -op co option for students who may be given the opportunity. Exactly, yes. That's what I was saying earlier, Janelle that um, you might put students into groups, you might have students to do individual presentations or group presentations, and you could, they might have a PowerPoint to go with their presentation. And so they would need to share the screen, <laughs> in which case you would need to make them a co-host. All right, a temporary co-host. All right. Um, so yes, any other questions? <clears throat> Okay, so we could go straight ahead. Um, so a quick recap where we are at this point, we looked at setting the, you know, setting up the Zoom session and all the before stuff, the stuff that you need to do before, um, prior to your Zoom session. Then we looked at things that you need to do during the, the Zoom session, the actual delivery. All right, now what we're gonna go into will be a little bit of the delivery because we were just talking about engagement but I'm gonna show you some more ways to engage your students in Zoom, all right? And then after we're gonna see, we're gonna look very quickly into sharing the recording and then we'll be done. <laughs> I told you it, was, it wasn't so painful, right? So some of the things that you could do, now we looked at some of the tools inside of my learning, I'm sorry, inside of 
of Zoom, such as the annotation features, the permission features. I think we all know you could do class discussions and presentations as we just spoke about, right? Um, you could have case studies. So let's say you presented, a, you gave students, you put them in groups and they had to look at these case studies and then come and present on these things. And then from that student presentation or group presentation, a class discussion might follow, right? Um, with regard to polls, now you could have polls done in, in, in uh, what you call it, Zoom, and you can have polls done externally, all right? I'll show you in just a bit how to create a poll um, in Zoom. I think it's in the next slide, but before we move on, you also have external applications that could also be used to engage your students and you integrate them into Zoom. And when I say integrate them, I don't mean like a programming and a licensing and a, you know, um, a algorithm kind of thing, but more like you, just as you're sharing your screen, you're sharing a PowerPoint, you could share other applications. So for example, I could share a Kahoot game or Kahoot, and I'll show you in a couple slides down. Um, these are all gaming platforms. Poll Everywhere is a polling platform. So for example, the, the, the activity we did for the icebreaker, I use Poll Everywhere. Why? Because it was something that was a little more, um, I don't say animated, but it's something that gives not just the real time responses, but the graphics and all these different things allow for a little more insight. All right, of course you could share videos, you could play a video and have persons Mentimeter is nice to explain Mentimeter to me, um, Ronald, if you don't mind. Hi everyone, Mentimeter is similar to like the polling software, it's like something where you could use yes. online mm -hmm. and you have a password attached to each session and you just give it to all the participants and like it's a real time sort of thing. So the graphics come up immediately as people type in stuff. You could have like word clouds and things like that. Definitely. I totally forgot about um, Mentimeter. Mentimeter. Very good. I, um, that is similar, as you mentioned, to Poll Everywhere. Um, so I'm glad that you mentioned that. All right. Um, so yeah, so you have these different, I, I was, I don't know why my mind went blank when I saw Mentimeter, but yes, you're very right. Um, you have simulations as well, such as who wants to be a millionaire and Jeopardy and these different things as well. I was saying as well that you could show videos, like if I were to show you a video here, but I find that to be not so engaging. What I prefer to do is send the URL in the chat, like how I sent you the, the poll everywhere link in the chat, give you like a 30 seconds to, to, to look at the video or however long the video is. And then we come back and have a class discussion. Yeah, or give each group a different video or URL, right? And then have them do a presentation on it, what they gather from that video, how they would deal with that situation, whatever the video was about, right? So what I'm saying is that these um, avenues, and the reason I'm saying avenues, their strategies and technology tools, these can use um, in together or in a combination. You could use any combination of these tools or techniques um, or strategies to engage students. So like I said, you could use a URL or video and then assign them to different group, groups in your class and then have them do a, a student discussion, a student presentation, sorry. And after the presentation, a discussion, a class discussion would follow. And then after that, you could probably take a poll. Yeah? So, Oh, the breakout rooms. Um, the, well, the thing with the breakout rooms, normally it's for a particular um, platform, not, not platform, sorry, plan. All right. Um, we don't have that so much on this campus that I know of. Yeah. But the breakout rooms, and as I mentioned earlier, is something that comes with a particular plan, like Zoom for education, so to speak. Yeah. So when you are setting up your, your, your breakout rooms or whatnot, you're not, well, first of all, you're not going to see that because it doesn't allow you to create breakout rooms. 
Or you have it in FFA, is that so? Well, Ronald, do you wanna? Right, I was not gonna say. <laughs> there you go. In most accounts um, that we have, and that's the same thing I was saying, you, we, we don't have that feature. Well, in our account, we don't have that feature. In a couple others, we don't. But Ronald, for the sake of everybody, would you, could, do you mind sharing um, if you could remember the process at all? Uh, basically, you have to go into the Zoom settings in account management and enable it. And once you enable it, you then see an icon at the bottom mm -hmm. of the, um, the Zoom page. Right, when you open right. Zoom, you just see an icon, uh, which I think it looks like two. Uh, <laughs> no, two but right, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, and then in addition to that, you have to set up, like once you enable it, you can set up the questions in the background. Mm -hmm. Like you could attach the polls to breakout rooms and things like that. But the breakout rooms, you could simply access it by enabling it in the account management. Then you could mm -hmm. open it up. And while you uh, start it in the Zoom meeting, mm -hmm. you are able to, whoever is the host can assign different people to different groups or it can be done randomly. Yes. Right. So that, that basically explains. Very good, Ronald. Thank you so much for that. It basically... <laughs> It explains, I think you did a very good job um, explaining how to create a pool, right? So at least you know when, when not a pool, sorry, uh, breakout rooms. Um, what I like in particular is the fact that you, because that's what I was kind of gearing towards, um, the icon you're going to see at the bottom of the screen, right? The two-person icon. Yeah? So what you would need to do, guys, is, is talk to a technician. The same technician who is setting it up right? He or she will need to, um, you need, will need to let them know whether to enable it or disable it. All right. Any other questions so far? All right. We're almost there. So in terms of creating a pool, right? Um, these are some things that you want to consider when creating a pool. I'm not sure why my graphics screwed my heading and so on, but anyways. So um, with regard to creating a pool, it's very simple. Um, you click on pools. Well, you see the process here. What I'm going to do now is uh, make, let me see, I could make Ronald. All right, a co-host. And Ronald, are you seeing, now that you're a co-host, let me just verify. Are you seeing um, the ability to add a pool? Yes, I am. Good. <laughs> so, I, Ronald, if you don't mind, could you create a pool for us? And you could, you could kind of Walk I can, but I'm using my phone, so that'll be a little bit challenging. Oh, at the okay, okay, no, okay. Well then, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let me make someone else up. Uh, 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 let me see. Um, Marsha, are you there still? Hi. Yeah. All right. So, I'm making you a co-host, and what I want you to do now is um sort of model how to create a pool so basically i'm not sure if you ever watch food network you know in food network when they create when they're making a meal of some sort of a dish they will tell you exactly what they're doing along the way so <laughs> so i want you to take that approach teach us how to create a pool and it's the process is right here but you can walk us through okay i kind of see a pool are kind of built in already um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you should see it at the bottom of the screen. Good. Right. Right. So that was actually my pool, but that's all right. <laughs> I can steal your pool though. <laughs> my pool. <laughs> so go ahead, guys. Go ahead and, and, and click your session. Click your um, response. So one person, uh, right. And you notice you could see how many persons um, replied. All right. 
So you have six persons who, who said yes. Well, thank God for that. So <laughs> <laughs> now, you could stop and share the results and you could relaunch your poll. So let's say you realize you have much more than six persons and you wanna, you know, make it open. There, you can do that there. Now, what Marsha did, she went from, let's say step, the last two steps, or probably just the last step, <laughs> click, click launch pool. But to, to, to the, the, the entire step would be click on pools, right? Which would be at the bottom here. Um, at which point she's gonna see this graphic we see over here. Um, with who was the first person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, she's probably gonna see that or, yeah, I think that's what you saw, right? And then you click that poll and then you click launch poll. Um, but sometimes you might have to create a poll from scratch, a, a poll item, a prompt, all right? In which case, you're gonna click add a question, say where you see in launch, let me just move this. So where you're seeing launch poll over here, you're gonna see add a question. All right, and then you go a separate window will pop up. You just insert your question, which will be the prompt and the responses, the possible responses. Then you click add, um, then you click add question and then it's gonna appear on a list like this. Oh, good, it came up again. Oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, it keeps on coming up, sorry. Oh. <laughs> and pulled. Yeah, and good. So there we have it. So any questions on creating a poll? Okay, good. It's, it's one, one, one thing, um, it may be useful for us to, to um, indicate that the polls could be anonymous as well. So yes. in the event you're just looking for uh, you know, a general thing and students don't want to be identified with a particular mm -hmm. response, Mm -hmm. You could You're make definitely. them anonymous. Yeah. You're definitely right. So like just now, that poll was anonymous. So I couldn't see that, let's say, Lister clicked yes or no. Or if, 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 if Rajkumar said, no, he didn't enjoy it, you know, I wouldn't know it was Rajkumar. <laughs> right? If, if it wasn't beneficial to him. So, you know, it, 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 and we know why things, why that option is there, right? So if you were to, to, to kind of take it and take, bring it all together a little bit, we looked at um, annotations in terms of ways in which you could engage your students in Zoom. Annotations, um, sharing permissions, making them be presenters to share screens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we looked at uh, the, we talked about class discussions and so on. We talked about um, we looked at polls, how to create a poll. All right. And now we're going to move very quickly into the um, external platforms. All right. So you, like I said earlier, you have poll everywhere, which we already mentioned. So we know it's a virtual polling platform. So in the event that you don't want to use the polls in Zoom, you can use a poll. You can use poll everywhere, which of course would give you the graphic. The, the, you could use a whole slide to, 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 you could, to cater to that poll. Um, let me just say this to compare it to Blackboard Collaborate. For those of you that might be familiar with Blackboard Collaborate, um, the poll, you see how this particular poll I was able to create in advance of the session or ahead of the session, right? In Blackboard, you can't do that. In Blackboard, you have to stay on that poll page or sub page or tab. If you move from that tab, you're going to lose your poll. So this is just a, to show one of the ways in which Zoom is a little... Um, more user friendly or, or, or you know intuitive um, over Blackboard. Even though I said earlier that Blackboard is more designed for teaching and learning. So keep those things in mind. Eh? All right. The, the, one of the main differences, even though Blackboard is designed for education, Zoom is more user friendly, right? In terms of access, in terms of navigation and so on. It's a little more user friendly. Um, Kahoot, I think we know about Kahoot a little bit. Um, it's an, a, another gaming application, as I mentioned earlier. And let me just back up a little bit with regard to polls. How would you use polls in your sessions? Anybody? Anybody? 
how would you integrate polls, uh, uh, whether it's a poll everywhere or the Zoom polls, how would you integrate those in your um, session? Maybe at the end of a particular topic and you want to get feedback from the students on whether they understood it or not, or? Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, very good, very good. So it's good to, to as, as you said, who is that speaking, Lestra? Yes. Right, so it's good as a review activity, right? But it can also be used as a introductory activity, as a, as a, as a, not just as a review activity, activity but a preview activity. So, or pre, um, like a needs assessment, so to speak. So you could use it for feedback, as Rudy is saying as well, but you could use it as a pretest, as Shaman is also saying, right? Or a needs assessment. So let's say, for example, oh, a good example is like what we did earlier in this session. I took a poll to get your feedback or your, not feedback, but your, it was a sort of needs assessment. It actually was, not, not, Right, so Robert, um, prophesying the icebreaker. So I was able to get an idea of some of the technology, technologies that you used in the past. Um, I noted from that that your technology use has increased pre-COVID to now. Um, most of you are familiar with, um, well, some of you are familiar with Blackboard, My Learning, um, Skype, WhatsApp. And it, you know, and use these things in education. So, it's a good thing to 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 gauge as Charmin is saying, um, pre knowledge or prior knowledge. And this is always something that you need to integrate in terms of instructional design. Now, that you want to integrate or consider integrating um, to your online session, because when you when you get to incorporate students' prior knowledge and experiences, they feel more engaged, and the research has shown this, they feel more engaged, they feel more a part of the session, it feels more like we're learning together as opposed to you just talking to me, <laughs> yeah, or me talking to you. Um, the student feels more included, all right? So if you can't think of a, of a good icebreaker, such as, you know, a video or whatnot, Try a poll. It might be more engaging than just showing a, a YouTube video and say, look at that, <laughs> right? So keep that in mind. Um, I was saying that Kahoot and these other applications are pretty good as well in, in engaging your students. You have these simulations um, of real life game shows, such as Jeopardy and Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And I think Family Feud as well is another one. So these are other ways in which you can engage your students. Now we have a workshop, I do a workshop as well on game-based learning and education. And maybe who knows, we could do something on that later on. Um, well, of course, when you get, when you, when you settle in a little bit with Zoom and these other things, all right? But these are, I just wanted to highlight to you that these are different things that you can combine with Zoom to make it, to spruce it up. <laughs> and make it a more engaging session, all right? Yes, Ronald, definitely, all right? Um, and who knows, we could do, I also do a workshop on cool tools in education, and Ronald, we could do something together and we could make it happen for the rest of the department, all right? So with regard to the recordings, as we, we close to wrapping up, with regard to the recordings, um, these are the basic steps, all right? Now, I think we outlined this in the beginning where the host is the one who will, depending on how the meeting is set up, of course, the host is the one who will probably, um, if it is set to, to, to store in the cloud, store in the cloud means that it will be stored to your Zoom account, which would be whoever the technician is um, that is creating the, the, the sessions, all right? It can also be stored on your device, on your computer, all right? And if it's stored on your computer, then what happens, and I'll show you in the next slide, Zoom creates a, a folder where the recording will be, you know, like a separate folder, I think in your documents, your My Documents folder, and um, you could get your recording there, all right? That's if you want a little more autonomy in, in 
let's say when the class gets a recording or if you want to do it just you want to be a little more independent in terms of viewing the recording before um, you send it out and that sort of thing um, like I said if it's in the it, you know even if it is you happen to delete it from your from your desktop from your computer it should also it should still be stored in your zoom account all right now this is what it might look like um, when the recording folder, if you want to store it on your desktop, on your computer, I keep saying desktop, but on your computer. Um, like I said, it stores in, it normally by default goes to your My Documents folder and um, you can play the audio, which would be like an MP3, for example. You can um, also play it as a Zoom file or an MP4. Yeah, I'm thinking the same, Shaman. You might probably want it on your computer as well because um, um, whether it is to upload into, you know, for whatever reasons um, you might need. If you want to delay the time that students get the recordings, that might be something you want to consider. So I guess Marsha could talk to that. <laughs> Marsha, I don't know if I put any on the spot. Uh, no, um, probably we will, um, yeah, y'all could store the recording and we'll probably just share it. And can we upload it onto my learning? Yes. Now, what I would recommend is that you upload it as a link to my learning. I think okay. I that earlier, yeah. You could, let's say, for example, you were to download it, guys. Um, you know, you could put it on a Google Drive um, or on a YouTube channel if you have one, uh, you know, and... That way persons wouldn't need to store, it wouldn't take up space on your machine or on your, you know, whatever, right? And that way you will always have it or you will have a backup of it. So let's say you have it in Zoom. You could also have it in a Google Drive or a YouTube channel, right? Yeah. And if you need to reuse it or, you know, for whatever, for the following cohort or you want to make a reference date of some sort, then by all means, it'll be there ready for access. All right. So how much, how much space we need to record to our session? How much space you need to record a session? To two hours session. Oh, a two hours session. Oh, how much that, that I might probably have to get back to you on that, but it shouldn't take too much space to be quite honest with you, because, and it's similar to if you have any, if you've used Blackboard before, it's the same thing. It's the thing is these things, once it's stored on your device, it usually stores as an MP4. And an MP4 is one of the more compatible and smaller video sizes, this, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it, it wouldn't require much space. It's almost like if, um, have you ever tried to store or save something as a, let me see, as let's say a, a, an audio file. Now an audio file, you could save it as a WM, WMA, Windows Media, Media Audio File, um, which would only play on a Windows <laughs> computer, right? Okay. You can't play a WMA on a Mac, for example, or on a phone for example, right? But you could play an MP4, sorry, an MP3. Once it's in an MP3 version, then it could play on just about anything. Likewise for an MP4, as a, you know, as opposed to alternative things. So the, the advantage of having it as an MP4 means one, that it's more compatible, right? Okay. Uh, across different devices. Two, it's a lot smaller than most other formats, okay. all right? Yeah, um, so, sorry, uh, the MP4, I was just checking to see I had one recorded before. The MP4 um, files for a two-hour session is about 46 to 50 megabytes. There we go, which is pretty small compared, considering that it is a two-hour um, thing, right? And then, to you know, it depends on, on what comprises that MP4, what's, what's in it. But generally, if it's just an audiovisual kind of thing, it, it wouldn't be as much as you think. So you wouldn't need, what I'm saying is like, you wouldn't need a whole gig of memory just to store a two hour lecture, right? And I think, was that um, Ronald, were you speaking there? 
No, I no no. Oh, so could you give me a name? Sorry. It's Ronald who, who just said that you stored on MP4, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just giving you a yeah. Yeah, so Ronald yeah, yeah. gave you an idea of, of how big um a two hour lecture would be, right? As an MP4. Uh profs made mention, well, wanted to know about editing. Now to edit your recording, you would have to take it to an external platform because Zoom doesn't really do much editing or any editing for that matter. Um, you could use a couple different platforms. There's um, some from, well, some that come with a Mac machine built in by default. I think it's iMovie. And then you have those that come with, um, let's say for, that would be more compatible with a Windows machine. Now I find platforms such as um, Windows, Windows, um, is it Windows Media, Media Windows Movie Maker, um, tend to be pretty good at doing those things. In fact, a lot of the recordings that <clears throat> and webinars that we've done in the CTO, um, I edit them using um, on another machine, of course, that has Windows Media Editor, and then. I put it onto YouTube and then make it more available for everybody. So that's probably how you're going to get this recording as well. You're probably going to get it as a YouTube link. All right. Any other questions? Oh, I think somebody mentioned in the group chat, sorry, in the chat, um, <clears throat> if the department has a policy I think Shaman made mention of that. So I don't know, Marsha, do you want to speak to that? Or is that, you could say yes or no, or if, it's, if there's a policy or any sort of protocol. All right, Prof said no questions, okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm hearing something. Oh, I thought I was hearing something. All right, so as we go further now to review some of the topics we did, we looked at, um, we looked at the before, prior to a session where you have to set up your Zoom session. Um, and I, again, I encourage you to, set, to schedule them in advance. Um, how participants, we looked at briefly how participants will be invited. You said the technician would send out those things. Um, and we looked at delivering a session how to, what are some good things that you need to do during a session to engage your students, to enhance the teaching and learning process, to take it from um, a talk fest to a more meaningful learning, ex learning experience. Yeah? Oh, we were saying earlier that the, the in the chat, sorry, uh, we were saying that the session gets saved either on your machine or your device, or on the, um, and also I should say, on the, the account, the host will have it as well, which would be in your case, the technician. All right. All right, so we looked at um, what you need to do at the beginning of a session, you need to pull up your PowerPoint or whatever document you plan to share. Um, you enter the, the, the room, you insert the, well, before you enter the room, you're going to get prompted. You click on the link, then you're going to get prompted to put in a password or and whatnot. Then you're going to ensure that your audio and visual or video capabilities and more so your, your, your audio would be uh, on point. Then you click share screen. Then you... Um, then you select whatever you're trying to, to share, and that's it. Um, seeing in the, in the chat, what is the extension? The extension in terms of what the technician to contact? Or the extension of the file? File, file extension, I believe. Oh, um, let me go back to. So, this is what it might look like. Right. Um, if you look at this graphic here, you're going to see um, 
well, you, you're not going to see the exact extension, but you're going to see, it gives you an idea of what you're going to look for and where it's stored. So it's in my documents, Zoom, and then, of course, you notice you're going to see the time of the, and date of the meeting, and what the title of the meeting is, and then the, the number. And that's if it's stored in your, on your device. If it's something that is in Zoom, then it's going to look at like this. So if you look at step three, look at the, the extension here. All right. It's the same thing that you would see on your machine if it's stored there. Notice where you have audio only, audio visual, and that kind of thing. You also have here play audio only, play the entire video separately, or open in, in, in thing. I see Ronald has a raise hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking that a lot of this lecturers would not have seen before because this background stuff in terms of the Zoom account, mm -hmm. we, well, at least for our department and some of the experiences I would have had, I only know this because I have my own account. Mm -hmm. But from the university, you request an account, the ID technician sends you the link, sends you the link and the password and the meeting ID. Right. So I think, I don't know if it's going to change in future where people have access to the, the account itself. But all of these background things where you set up the polls, you indicate, um, you know, where the extension, where the files are to be saved, et cetera. We don't have control over that because you need to have the account uh, settings uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. So, but if you want, if you want the, the recording to be stored on your, on, your, on your machine, you just need to talk, that's what I was saying earlier, to talk to your, your technician, all right? So if you want a copy of the, of the recording um, and you are made the host, then you should be able to get the file, a copy of it at least, on your machine, if you have the room for it, all right? But like I said earlier, it, you're always going to have a backup in the actual, the host account, right? So of course, that's the backend side of it, as Ronald was rightfully saying. And then, of course, if you want a copy of that. Now, I wouldn't recommend, let me just say, I wouldn't recommend that everybody has access to this account because then, you know, you need to manage your account. You don't want things being done with, you know, and you can't account for them. So I agree with the technician managing the account. And if, you know, if you need, if it is that you didn't store it on your device, then you can contact the technician to get a copy of that recording. That's what I was trying to see, to show you the both sides of it. All right. Um, we, does that answer your question? Uh, I keep, uh, Rajesh, is that it? Let me know if that answers your question, okay. Um, and just as we, okay, good, great. Um, and as we continue to recap, we were able to, we looked at record, you know, what you need to do in recording a session, presenting in a Zoom session, how to share your PowerPoint, how to engage students, whether it's annotation, um, text, class discussions, polls, external platforms, um, which include Kahoot and all these other things. Um, Jeopardy and simulations and so on and Mentimeter, Poll Everywhere, etc. And then we looked at how we could share the recording. Now sharing the recording, once you have it here, let me just back up a little bit. The um, technician can send you a link to the actual recording. So even if you don't have it stored on your device, your, your computer, in your My Documents folder, the technician can also share the, send the link to you with the presentation. All right. All right. So as we, the curtain should really be closing. I don't know why it's so good. <laughs> um, just to recap, you are now able to uh, do these things, identify the steps in creating a Zoom session, describe the ways in which it can be used to engage students, and access a Zoom recording. Um, any other questions, guys?
Oh, thanks so much, man. Thanks, Ronald, as well. All right, I see everyone does. Okay, great. I'm glad it was helpful. All right. Anytime, Janelle. <laughs> so, guys, so guys, mm -hmm. as you go forward, that little sound effect was just in case you were falling asleep. <laughs> um, uh, so you're going to get a, a, a link in your email. Not now, but during the course of the day tomorrow, you're going to get a link um, to uh, set up, to, to evaluate this session, sorry. Um, and just to give some feedback, um, you know, so we could improve this session and even how, you know, I could continue to assist you um, going forward in terms of what, what kind of assistance you would need next, what kind of workshop you might need next. All right? And always remember, guys, that as you do your, your virtual sessions, um, you want to make them very practical, very collaborative, um, you know, very useful, very creative in some regards, um, because all these things, these are keywords that, um, that make the teaching and learning process much more effective right and meaningful so i think that's it for me there <laughs> all right have a great evening everyone thank you thank you no problem and see i promise it was pain it wasn't so painful right no, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, well just, I'm just gonna take some time to thank you for taking you know time out from your Tuesday evening to, to deliver this very informative um, presentation. We really appreciate it. And I, I'm sure a lot of people found this enjoyable and, um, and learned a lot from this session. Thanks so much for that. Thank you so much for that. And if you need any help, guys, any, any assistance, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, right? And I'll be there to, to, I don't mind helping and providing as best as I can any sort of assistance when necessary. All right? Great. We appreciate it. And yes, I'll share your email with some of our part-time staff. So if they have any further follow-up questions, they can, um, you know, contact you. Sure. Sure. No problem. Okay, great. And I want to thank all the participants for taking time out to join the session. I hope you enjoyed it and, you know, um, found it informative as well. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. All right, guys. It's okay, about that have time. Have a good evening. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Have a good evening, Bye -bye. everybody. All right. Thanks, Marshall. Okay. Thanks, Justin. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.